Hello, everybody. Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Thanks for joining us this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. My name is Chris P. And today, I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by Amy Price of the English FA and uh, the Master of Video Game Design. Amy, thanks for joining us. No problem. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah, thanks again. We, we set this up months ago and then uh, COVID-19 hit. We could have done this five or six times, right? Um, Amy, give us a, give us, tell us about your journey. How did you end up where you're at and, and with what you're doing? Yeah, so I've just um, always loved football. So I started coaching when I was 16 and just trying to tap into as many coaching experiences as I could for like a number of years and kind of like, well, part of the way into doing that, I realised that I was quite interested in, in using games as a tool to develop players and engage players and probably became really quite biased with that looking back like probably became a little bit obsessed with um, designing these cool games for the kids to play and um, I then realised I probably need to go to university so I actually went quite late I went at like 21 which typically all my friends were, were going to uni at 18 but I wanted to go because I wanted to find out more about that side of coaching um, about the pedagog pedagogic side of coaching and particular games based stuff and um, as a result of that like I, I didn't know it at the time but I went to St Mary's University Twickenham which happened to be like a real a real hub for like yes PE teaching but also like um, coaching pedagogy and games based in particular with people like Len Almond who who taught at the university and ended up like he uh, he was also like a vis visitor, visiting professor as well, which was amazing. And yeah, so I like went to uni and then like at that point, like realised, OK, I think I'm going to. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah, I, something just something just cut through. But yeah, so and then I did a dissertation on it um, because I got so obsessed with finding out more in terms of the research side of game base. So I did a dissertation on it and that's where it took me into video game design because I was looking wider than just sport. I was interested in like other industries that use games and obviously with, like, with video games being so successful for so many years in terms of engaging players, but sorry, engaging people, but also like making them really like addicted to games and better at playing games and and stuff and so I stumbled upon it by accident to be honest with you kind of was just like looking around on the internet and googling stuff and just stumbled across this unbelievable opportunity to link video game design to football coaching that's uh that's brilliant and I know uh in previous you know podcasts or webinars you you mentioned uh Professor James G's work right out of Arizona University is that correct yeah the absolute legend he is yeah 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 so that's yeah. uh that's amazing so as you know you said you went to university late at 21 um and were fueled by games based which is you know i see myself as a very games based coach i don't know how the players i coach would see me um actually i do um but it's uh i love the way that you your the way your mind worked to link the two right um, because I think what we hear these days is, is, well, kids play too much video games. So the, the fact to bring the video game to the children and to the pitch was brilliant. Yeah. And you know what? Like I have so much to owe to like James G at Arizona state because like he, his work, if you, if you ever, if you ever get a chance just to, to get some of his books and have a look at the, the detail he goes into in terms of learning and what is good learning and he talks about good game design and all these principles and features that game designers like are, are like are aware of when they plan and design games it's fascinating stuff um it's very which one, would you which one would you recommend Dame? good games and good you learning 2013 that's a really good one so could you repeat that sorry uh good games and good learning good games good learning okay yeah, that one very good. The anti-education era is also quite a good read. Okay. Um, so yeah, he's he's just like done loads of the legwork on this, and I've just kind of taken it and interpreted it into a coaching context where I think it's more this stuff can be applied and um, just utilised by teachers and coaches. 
you know. Yeah. Yeah. So now I don't want to get too deep in because I did have a question around that and maybe you'll touch upon it in, in your presentation, but maybe I, I'll, I'll hold the question. Okay. But, uh, you know, if you, if you want to start and then, uh, I got to, I'm writing the question down. So I remember it. Okay. Yeah. So I kind of just wanted to start with this concept of learning is always possible. Um, especially in soccer, because I guess the underpinning of like why we would use video games is because we want players to become really good at knowing how to learn. And I guess the mechanism that, that promotes that is video game design. Because if you think about the best games that you've ever played in terms of like Mario, Sonic, my two personal favourites, you you get better as the game goes on, the more you play. And the feedback is so explicit, it's so clear when you're getting better. And there's always scope in every situation to find out something else about that game. Um, and I just see soccer as exactly the same, football's exactly the same as that. You know, there's a million possibilities in soccer. There's a million different opportunities to, to learn something about the game you're playing in. You know, there's 22 players on the pitch, 22 players with different skill sets. You've got two teams with different tactics, different strategies, different tendencies, different ways of responding to situations. And you've got like the contextual part of it, like the, what's the scoreline? Like, what's the weather like? Have yeah. we got any injuries? What about substitutions? It's just so much stuff. How much um, time is so... left? Right. Sorry, Chris? How much time is left? How much time is left? 100%. Yeah, it's, it's all of these things that like could influence how a player behaves and acts and decides what to do in a game. Tell us why you picked Eric. Eric is my favourite player. Uh, he's the absolute king, like big Man United fan through the 90s. Uh, not so much the 2000s. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yeah, I just, just put him on there because I think he's an absolute genius. Yeah, um, agreed. Agreed. Even Matthew Simmons thinks he's a genius too, I think. There you go. I think with it as well, like, I'd love to... Players like that who seem like everything's easy, they would have, um, they would have experienced times where, where their performance probably didn't look like that, even, like, even during their professional career, you know? So they're, they're probably still always learning. Um, I, I would love to be able to talk to a player like that and get into their head around... What are you thinking as you play? Like, what thoughts are going into your head as you're playing football? I, I find that really fascinating. Yeah, agreed. So, first of all, I think I've got to start with this, with this title. Um, just to sort of bust some myths out there, it's not gamification. Um, so, what I'm about to talk about for the rest of this webinar, like, it, it might seem like gamification, on paper it might seem that way and in practice it might seem that way but it's um it's not it's different and it, the purpose is, is is very different because a digital video games approach to coaching which we named in 2017 um following like like various kind of like studies and like um papers that we wrote and it's it, that's based upon g's good game design and that's about learning not about gamification, not about necessarily just engagement and motivation, but it, it, it takes it a step further. It's really based upon this idea of metacognition, which I'll talk more about um, as the webinar goes along. So essentially a video games approach is, is a way of coaching. Um, and a real big, like aside from being a good learner, which I've just spoken about, like this really big standout feature is this idea of game understanding. So it's focusing on like, who, who are our strategic players in our team? Who are those ones with a strategic understanding of the game? Not just like understands the tactics or understands the, t uh, the skills required to play, but who's strategic in that? So like in Eric Cantona, for an example of when we were talking about the information he must have in his head, or we assume he has in his head, 
how is he using that information to to make his decisions is he strategic with that is he in control of that is he consciously thinking about all of that stuff or or not i don't know but that's the keys it's like when you play at the moment i'm playing mario deluxe on my ds Lite, and i find myself like catching myself out sometimes where i'm actually thinking about what i'm thinking about i like i'm like oh my god i just i, like, I realize that i'm doing it as i'm playing it so I'm like thinking to myself as I'm playing the game, oh God, there's like this massive cactus ahead of me. Like it killed me last time. Um, and then I'm, then at that point I realize, oh, I'm just thinking about the fact there's a cactus. So that's what it is. It's about being conscious of what you're thinking as you're doing it. And it's just a tool, you know, like I, I would say about everything, like back in the day when I told you, like when I first got into coaching, I was like so obsessed with games based everything everything had to be in a game it was like it wasn't good enough unless it was a game there had to be an opponent all the time had to be directional had to be this had to be that and like i definitely turned full circle now um probably because i understand more about all the different approaches out there but just completely appreciating that it just depends on what you're trying to get out of it with the players you know so it, this this could be a good tool if you want to develop players who, who think strategically um, but then other tools do other things. So the way the webinar will kind of work is we want to go like the first part is like, why would we use a DVGA and what's its aims? And that's where we'll like delve more deeply into the, I guess, the more theoretic, theoretical side of it, um, the metacognition part of it, and trying to conceptualize that a little bit better in our in our own minds and then the second part probably the fun part for most people uh, will be how does it work so like what are the principles of this like in action like what what do they look like what would a session look like potentially or a game design um and yeah and sort of look at it in those two ways so this is something i must admit it's the first time i've showed this to anyone this model and it would be good to get feedback actually because i've showed it to a few of my friends just to get to get their insight on it but i was thinking about this and i thought in the middle arrow where you've got controlled thinking and uncontrolled thinking for me that's that that's that idea of a player who who uh controlled thinking is a player who knows what they're thinking and when they're thinking it and they're in control of their thoughts so they're tapping into knowledge about the game state, for example, time remaining, substitutions, scoreline, or they might be tapping into knowledge about you know, how to execute a certain skill. So I'm um, one beat one with a player, like how am I gonna get past them next time? Like what do I need to do with the ball? Or they're tapping into like more of a tactical concept where they're thinking about how they're gonna link better with their teammates to create more space. Um, or they might be tapping into some information they know about the opponent. You know, okay, I realise my opponent prefers it, prefers to take it on their right foot, for example. And being really like in control of like when to tap into what like knowledge source. And then at the bottom of that arrow, uncontrolled thinking, you have those players who you could still be like really effective, but they're they're more instinctive and they don't sometimes know what they're thinking or anything like that. They just end up performing and doing all right and actually in some instances doing unbelievably well in any given moment but when you ask them oh what were you thinking there they look at you like blank like what do you mean i don't know just 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 playing and i think in football you need a bit of both i think players there's times in football where instinctiveness is so so important and there's times where more controlled and plans and um conscious thinking is is massive and, and also it depends on like the situation doesn't it sometimes like if the situation is very uh very easy i might be like not needing to control my thoughts um, yeah, just or, go through the motions yeah exactly yeah and, and that's so, the thing with video games they they never like more often than not they put you in a situation where it's the perfect challenge level where you're getting frustrated and G calls it pleasant frustration. So it's that like 
it's just on the right challenge point. You're like, you're annoyed with the game, but you want to have another go. Yeah, I like that. And you, you said you want some feedback on this, but so Rusty Earnshaw's on too. So we could unmute him at some point and uh, see if he has questions on this. Unless you, yeah. Rusty is one of the friends you've showed it to. <laughs> he isn't yet. No, he isn't. Rusty, um, you've seen it here for the first time. Hope he's listening. <laughs> he is. He's writing. He's writing a presentation at the same time as well. So. Uh, yeah. So then the other arrow going across is, I guess, um, this idea of the fact that in football we we do have like eleven players on the pitch or nine or seven players or whatever it is, like it being a team sport. So. You know, the like, can we get all eleven players in control of their thinking and therefore having that shared understanding of the situation where they're working in synergy uh, versus sort of the other end of the spectrum where I can't say this word. Uh, I think it's dis disergy. I hope I've said that correctly, but it's like the opposite basically of synergy. So can we get dis is there team disergy sometimes where actually some people are on one page, some people are on the other page. And it doesn't all join up sometimes. Maybe because like maybe because some players have had to be really instinctive and just change like what they were doing, which another player didn't anticipate, for example. Or maybe the opposition has like really affected, really caused a problem, which for, for a moment in time, there's like this disergy that's going on. And I just thought, like, as a coach. Like it's just looking at this and going, you know what, every moment of the game that passes, our team could could like be in different corner of this box. Because it just depends on what's happening in that game, in the moment of the game. And then like as as coaches, like just seeing the pros and the cons to putting our players in certain corners of this box. So, you know, in training, we might actually want to, to have a situation where there's some disagree. Um, we might want to see how players respond to that versus the situation where actually we might really want to focus on um, players being really in control of their thinking and having some synergy. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's, it's a way of looking at the game in terms of what players are thinking, but also how they work together. I'm causing a little chaos. I'm going to unmute Rusty because I'm sure he's got a question around this. I just cool. Rusty, you're off mute. Good morning. Hey, hey. <clears throat> Sorry, I call it gamification. I'm most apologetic. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, we were talking I, I, about I, that I, offline before we started recording. I know. And a shout out to Amy, to be fair. Like, I've, you suddenly think you know some stuff in coaching and then you realise you're scratching the surface. Um, this is actually interesting and, I, and, I, and it's not really a question. It's more of a, we just, literally did a webinar with a couple of guys and they were talking about the Olympic semi and the Olympic final sevens and actually we had some conversations and it was exactly around this like there were moments where they were and it was often ball out of play and, and the stuff preceding it where they were thinking and they were kind of there was some team synergy but there was also some other moments in the game and actually it was the first time they'd ever watched it so they spoke about some of the I'm going to get the right boxes Maybe it's the controlled dis-synergy um, and some of the uncontrolled dis Um And it was the first time they'd ever watched the final, so that it was actually really interesting hearing them speak about it. <clears throat> it definitely made me more curious. I think You are a curious man, Rusty. <clears throat> Hi, Rusty. I didn't get to say hello to you. No. Um, yeah, That's I think right. just to add to that is, is like for coaches to be maybe quite deliberate in what do we want from the training session? Where do we want players to be in this training session? And like mostly, I know you can't you can't dictate that for every second of the game of, of the training session, but like seeing value in all four corners. But like I guess ultimately, in terms of the video <clears> games, <throat> you would hope that you, in in utilizing that approach consistently with players, they would be more on the controlled thinking side of it. It got me thinking about the stuff we do as coaches at the moment, though, that doesn't prepare them for the other bits. And also the things that we do that might mean that too much of our sessions are relatively controlled, and but, it, but they don't look like the game. Anyway, keep going, Amy. I just apologise yeah, for... I was going to say, yeah, like, 
by controlled thinking, I don't mean um, controlled practice design. You know, no, I know. Yeah, so it's like, how can we get players to basically be be the person that's like, be thinking about their thinking, but that's going to come out, it will come out in the rest of this presentation. So ultimately, it's like the whole game understanding piece, which like we hear loads, don't we? Like, and I'm, I'm one of, I've probably, uh, culprit of this in terms of like using the phrase but probably haven't spent enough time unpicking it you know like I'll, I'll say how oh, that player understands the game amazing well like that player I'm not so sure but like what does that term actually mean because video games for me like this is like a massive um outcome of playing video games is you really start to get to know that game like you know you know you start to be able to like predict the problems that are going to happen you start to to just be more savvy around like how to cause problems uh set problems for your opponents and stuff like that so having like interviewed a number of academy coaches in um in england we kind of like boiled it down to these this stuff here so if i start with this one here so game plans and playing style they're like two two themes that came out when asking these coaches like what is game understanding and I put game plans and not game plan because of course like those players that really understand the game like will have like individual plans as the game happens like on an individual basis me against the player I'm playing against as well as probably like a, a team plan which you'd hope changes depending on what happens in the game rather than just a plan A. Um, playing style was like a big one that came out in terms of is that good? Is that bad? Does it help? Does it hinder? Um, I'm definitely at the point now in my thinking where it's vital. Like I think it is vital, but like the kids that really, or the players that really, really have a good understanding in relation to playing style are the ones that can stretch the style. So I'm still playing in my style. We're still playing in our style, but I'm on the, I'm the outer edge of that. I'm sitting just on the outside of that, just trying to like stretch that a little bit more to be more unpredictable like to be harder to play against um because obviously if the opponent are, like sussed out your style and everything you do like you need to be able to stretch it and try some different stuff the stuff at the top here player reflection dealing with change game management them three are kind of linked as well so the coaches were saying you know those players that can reflect as the game is happening but also afterwards um, we know that like analysis is like a massive part of like football coaching these days with footage and like brilliant platforms like coach logic and stuff like that um but what about the reflection in the moment as it's happening like how can we start to start to help players become better at that dealing with change was a big one so the situations change like players got sent off like opponent have made a substitution or like um just in the last second of, of something, like the opponent has just done something different that I didn't expect. Like, how am I going to respond to that? Game management is the stuff we spoke about at the start of this conversation. Game state, um, the ebbs and flow of the game, um, trying to be in control of that, trying to manage momentum. And then in the corner here, these, these are kind of grouped together. So like, those players that know their strengths, they know what they're capable of doing, they know how to utilise that. Just like you're doing a video game, you know, just like I know if I've, I know I'm pretty good in Mario at the moment, I'm pretty good at anything where there's uh, like platforms that I need to quickly jump across uh, to avoid things that are dropping down on me. So there's a particular level at the moment that I, I'm pretty confident that that problem keeps occurring in the level but I'm, I'm pretty good at avoiding the things that are dropping on my head and jumping between platforms uh, individual targets like players who in football we we do like focus on the individual and, and give them stuff to work towards and they have stuff they want to work towards but when's the right time to practice that versus when's maybe not the right time to practice that stuff because whatever you practice has to suit the situation in the game it can't be forced um, so and, and it's that idea of recognizing the game difficulty. So does the player like realize tight like the difficulty of this situation? And if so, like is there a time where I can practice my target? And that's the whole video game piece as well, around recognizing when I'm out of my comfort zone versus recognizing when I'm comfortable. 
having a why is a big one. A lot of the coaches refer to around players who, when you ask them, like, why did you do that? They actually can give you some in-depth, like, reasoning for for their actions. So it was all of those key themes there that, like, that the coaches were saying is 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 what game understanding might be. And that was, like, important because if we're talking about strategic understanding and that's what apparently what a DVGA does then like that's why we wanted to unpick understanding and this was about outwitting my opponent so like wherever possible do we know how we're trying to do it do we know how to up, how to outwit our opponent are we consciously doing it is it happened by accident are we just doing it instinctively and not really thinking or are we on the same page and are we like thinking about how we're thinking about doing this so this is where like it made me think about like knowledge so to understand something i have to have knowledge so like, but what type of knowledge and obviously you, you might have the knowledge of the what and the who so you might know like about systems like 442 you might know about the pros and cons of 442 you might know how to get whip on the ball uh, when you're taking the free kick or you might know like who I'm like who I'm playing with and against you might know some of their attributes and, and how to utilize that which is massive and then in in addition you know how uh, to use that information like on the pitch so you might know how um how to well physically take part in the game and how to like make the most of the the what and the who knowledge and then like so so that's cool but the strategic part is the conditional so it's it's actually like knowing when to tap into the what and the who when to tap into the how so that you produce a when and a why so like the best example i can give of this which i saw on sky sports was jamie carragher and gary neville having a debate they were arguing over like should a team carry on building out from the back uh, even though it's not working so like every time they tried, like the opposition just read it, nicks it, got a shot on goal. And should they carry on doing it? Because that's what they believe in. Or should they like do something different, maybe go long? And um, Gary was adamant, no, stick to it, stick to it. That's what they've practiced. That's what they believe in. Shouldn't change it. You might lose respect from players, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Jamie was like, you know what? Like, why not tweak it? You know, like surely the players should be able to know like when it can be slightly tweaked and why they would be tweaking it at that moment in time so then actually like not going against our playing style because it's about stretching the style but it's just about when and the why, when and why we might tweak this and, and that's the strategic part that's like that's utilizing all of your knowledge bases in a really conscious way being in control of that um and may and and putting that into action does that make sense, Chris? It does, yeah, it does. And I think, you know, when, when you're talking about changing or stretching your style, you know, a, a game that comes to my mind is Man City Spurs um, in the in the in the quarter in the semi final of last year's Champions League. Right? Mm -hmm. Um there's a question that's come in from from John, um, and he's on your side of the pond. He says, so all about conscience consciousness of what a player does yeah I, i'd say um it's, it's that awareness piece um how aware are players in terms of their thoughts and can we get them into yeah. a state where they're like a little bit more aware and in control because i think then if you're if you're in control and aware of what you're thinking you're in a better position to affect what your affect your actions be more deliberate in your actions based upon what you know yeah and sometimes this takes this what this really takes in action is, is slowing stuff down a little bit you know slowing it down like with players everything seems to be 100 miles an hour doesn't it we want tempo we want like everything to be really quick fast pace you think you know what the beauty of a video game is yes it is intense sometimes depending on the game that you're playing yes it is like you know, you've got to make quick decisions and stuff, but you can slow down when you need to. You can have mm -hmm. those pauses. You can you can get catch your breath a little bit. 
Yeah, and it's it's funny, Aim, that you showed this one because, like, my I've got three boys, and my youngest is thirteen, and the youngest could, didn't talk till he was three, but he knew how to set up the Wii, get Mario Kart, come and grab me, and we'd play. <laughs> like, I think almost every day before he went to preschool and after, and we'd play Mario Kart, and the way he figured it out, um, and you know, he just just the, you know he just knew. He couldn't communicate, but he was communicating kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. But just then you do the team Mario and, and just, it's funny that you showed that um, because it just takes me back to that and the fact that he could uh, think about that. He says, uh, does Amy think that this type of conversation can be had with grassroots players and teams? From John. Um, in terms of the approach itself, in terms of the, the principles that we'll speak about later, absolutely yes. Like one hundred percent, yes. I think it's it's just the way you frame it as a coach, like setting, like designing good practices that integrate the five design principles. You know, I've seen coaches use it with like completely new novice players uh, versus like really kind of elite, like experienced, even adult footballers as well. Because it's it's it's, just, it's applicable for everyone, right? Strategic understanding is applicable for senior players looking to win games uh, or any player looking to develop, you know, plus players that are just in it for for enjoyment, um, for the love of the game. Yeah, you know? and, and I think every everybody at some stage has played some type of video game, right? Yeah, I'd say so. I, I should hope so, <laughs> except maybe my dad. Um, there's, a, there's a question that's come in from Steve Davis from London, um, but way of Connecticut now. It says, conditional when and why has to consider the desired outcome. What is the objective and is it short term or long term? It's about creating synergy, two plus two equals five. Um, I think, yeah, there is, there is an element of uh, knowing what you want as a player. So if I, for me to tap into my when and why as a player, I need to have an idea of what I'm trying to achieve in that moment. Mm -hmm. Whether that objective is just something in like that's involving myself. Next time I like I might be a full back up against like a tricky winger, and I might just be thinking, right, next time we're in this one v one, like my objective is X, Y, and Z, or whatever. Force force to play on that side, or get him get him him or her onto their weaker foot. It has to be driven by an objective, I'd say, like. But that objective, like I say, could be individual, could be more of a, a unit or a team based objective. Um, there's a massive thing in here around planning and, and players, players being able to plan and not kind of just um, do stuff by accident. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like we would do, I would do a little exercise where it's 1v1 and then I would have the players give feedback to the player they just played to so and then they would rotate kind of thing this is when we're allowed to have contact in football um and you know then that player had to plan their strategy against the player they just placed based off the feedback they got from somebody who just played them would that fall that wouldn't would that really fall into part of this amy or no i mean i i, I sounds like it it sounds okay. like you're trying to get them to to be more thoughtful on their process, you know, like getting them to um, to be more thoughtful about their next move. Um, and there's a million ways, isn't there? Like in terms of the actual five principles, like would that fall under the idea of pausing the practice and getting them to talk to each other about X, Y, and Z? Um, I'm not sure. Could it become some? Could it become a superpower? Yeah. You know, could, that opportunity to talk to your opponent about what they what they noticed about how you played that could become a superpower in itself. Yeah, which is you got my brain. My, I'm a hundred miles an hour. My brain's going. <laughs> I have got three pages already. <laughs> so, um, so this metacognition piece. So, like obviously, the, the guy at the bottom here, Flavel, like he is the like in my opinion the god in this area and. I've utilised some of his, his work like in this, well, all of his work really to try and understand it. So I guess to start with, like what is metacognition? Like 
I understand it to be this like this this concept of I'm thinking about how to solve this problem, um, not just to make progress in the game, not just to like you know overcome this situation, but to actually I'm thinking about it because I want to like actually become aware of whether it's working or not, whether my whether my process and my solution to this have actually has actually worked. You know, because you can teach someone to solve to solve problems, which is cool. But at this, like, are they able to actually know whether that solution worked or not? You know, how quickly can they uh, pick up that? Oh my God, I've tried this solution; it didn't actually work too well. I've ha I'm going to have to tweak it. So it goes back to that when and why. Um, you know, going back to the Gary Neville and Jamie Caribou example. You know, if we're just going to keep doing the same thing because we think it's a solution to a problem, but it's, it's we've not realised that it's not and that we need to tweak it, then we're struggling because we're not making any progress in the game. There's a, it's probably like a big underpinning piece on like reflection in that statement. So it's about in, being in control and regulating your own thinking, like ideally in live play as it's happening which goes back to those knowledge sources, like tapping into the right source at the right time um, to, to meet the objective of, of what you're trying to achieve in that moment. And you think about it as well, by the way, in football, that's hard to do, isn't it? Like, how hard is that? If you think about an actual match day where, you know, as a coach, you don't have much control of the situation. You can't just suddenly stop play for the players. You can't adapt the the situation to bring out anything like it is a match at the end of the day and everything happens so fast so for a player to, to to do this stuff it is really hard and they probably won't be able to think metacognitively for 90 minutes um but also just to bring it back down to reality is like human beings in general so outside of football like we probably all think metacognitively a lot of the time um and like apparently like some evidence has shown that kids as young as four and five can start to work on this stuff on these skills it's just whether you know in education in, in like organized sport it's just whether there is like a a method or an approach of like that focuses in on metacognition or not and how much we expose young players to it Imagine if you started doing something like practicing metacognition and refining metacognition at the youngest, the youngest ages in football. Imagine like what would the game look like when they became, when they went into senior football. Imagine how how flexible they would be as a performer. How much they would tap into that when and why and tweaking stuff and um, being able to monitor their progress in the game themselves, find different solutions to problems, seeing if they're working or not. So I'm just trying to think about like a player in this situation. So as a player, I might like, I might be thinking in a situation, so I take the fullback uh, being faced against this tricky winger. I might have to think, first of all, what process will I use to solve this problem? So the problem is that the winger, the winger is quicker than me, more skillful than me, gets past me every time. I've noticed that early doors in the game because I've got beat three times already. So what process, the thought, the thought of the player might be, what process will I use to solve this problem? So not just the solution to the problem, but also like um, what process will I use to solve this problem? And I've been looking into processes and I find it quite fascinating to be fair, because there's actually like quite a lot of different processes people go through to solve problems, copying being one of them. Copying is like a massive, we associate it with kids, don't we, copying? It's actually like a, even for adults, quite an important um, process to go through. I got through university that way, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So like, it's like repetition, like there's copying, there's, um, there's other stuff around like grouping and categorizing information um, which is another way of like solving it like solving the problem there's 
there's more like um, elaborative ways like mental note taking um which i think is really key to football sometimes is uh, in this example here your mental note taking might be right next time next time his player is up against me next time he receives receives the ball i'm going to make a note of what his first touch tends to be like or what foot he tries to get the ball on little things like that because because that's quite clever of a player then because what you're doing is you're not just panicking about oh my god what am i going to do here how do i stop him it's like right i've i've got a, a process here i'm going to look out for x and i'm going to make a mental note of that and then next time i face him that that little mental note might actually help me to stop that player getting past me yeah just noticing noticing right what are the tendencies and yeah yeah definitely um, Self-questioning is another one, like the players ask themselves questions in their head, obviously, during the game, like about the opposition, like, does that player, is that player quicker than me? Just ask yourself the question, I wonder if that goes through players' heads. I'm sure it does, but are, are they conscious of it? Are they aware? Or have they deliberately used that as a process to overcome the problem? The next question they might ask themselves is, right, I have to, you know, it might be mental note taking. I'm going to look out for what type of touch that player gets next time he gets the ball and what foot he likes. OK, am I executing this process effectively? So I've tried mental note taking. Did I do it? Did I really execute that very well to make the most out of that as a process? Did I look early enough? Did I look in the right places? What was I really looking for? Where were, my, where were my eyes attracted to? Um, do I need to try that again? Do I need to do it again and see if I can be better at mental note taking, be better at taking that picture, that mental pitch that we talk about in football all the time? And then lastly, like maybe I need to use a different process. Maybe like that mental note taking and looking out for that, like wasn't suitable. It wasn't a suitable process. It didn't actually help me to solve the problem. Maybe I need to, I need to try something else. Maybe I need to look on the other side of the pitch. Maybe I have to look at my opposite fullback and see how the opposite fullback is dealing with the other tricky winger on the other side and just copy, copy whatever he or she does. So, so for players to think, think like that is obviously like very hard and it needs to be coached for because otherwise it's not going to happen by accident, right? When there's mechanisms, the principles of a video games approach that we'll talk about later, which, which will hopefully promote this meta level thinking. So like in, in terms of metacognition as a theory, um, we're just trying to like boil that down into some game skills. So metacognitive game skills that coaches can go, you know what, like appreciate metacognition is important, but like this is the actual skill of metacognition and this is what we're trying to work on in this session today. So. If you're using a video games approach, it's likely that you're going to be working on one of these three things. So whether that be planning and replanning your next move. So in football, we talked about like the instinctive players who are like the instinctive moments, which are key, which are key in the game, but versus like being planned, which is also really key. And actually, like, how much do we work on instinctiveness versus how much do we work on, like, planning your next move? So, uh, like, a video games approach would would actually focus in on this skill. The next one is setting problems. So we might often in, in games-based approaches talk about like, solving problems. But this one is also, like, realising that whatever solution I, I find in this situation is an appreciation of how it will hurt my opponent, how it will, you know, cause them an issue, that knock on effect. And not that just happening by accident, but, but you know, a player is really deliberate in this. I'm using this solution because I know it's going to do X to them. And then the last one, which is finding out some useful information or information gathering, as some people call it. So, you know, like, do I need to find out if I am quicker, if I'm centre forward? Do I need to find out if I'm quicker or slower 
than the centre back who's marking me in today's game. Like, is that going to be an important piece of information to, to establish in order for me to do the above, as an example? So, whenever anyone's using a video games approach to coaching, it's like I would hope they're going to be doing it because they're focusing on one of those three skills or two or three of those skills. And not necessarily they're doing it because they're working on some sort of technical or tactical stuff, because that's not what the approach is supposed to do. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, and I'm sure you'll get into how we roll that in. To yeah. The, yeah, definitely. This is it. This is the second part of the, of the webinar where it's the more of that. How do we do it? Like. What are these principles of design and what does it look like in a, in a session, for example? So the first principle is the mission, which just going alluding to the previous slide is, you know what, like when we're using this approach, we're not actually setting any technical or tactical objectives for the players. So we wouldn't we wouldn't use this approach if we're looking to focus on passing or defending or counterattacking or build up play like that I wouldn't necessarily say this is this is the right tool if you're looking to hit those types of objectives um, which is why we use the word mission so like in using the word mission to create a game you're you're setting this goal you're setting a goal for for the the players or the teams to try and achieve so in Mario, it's like it's pretty clear from whatever Mario game you play. Definitely the deluxe one that I'm I'm playing at the moment. Like the princess has been like um, basically kidnapped, and it's up to Mario and Luigi and and his friends to to save her. And it's just like that's the goal. However you save the princess, that's up to you. You know, if you save the princess by becoming really good at jumping, really good at firing fireballs at baddies, or like really good at working with Yoshi to jump over and like avoid all of these like weird creatures that are trying to kill you, then so be it. And and that will like that will change. On one level you might be doing loads of like jumping over baddies with Yoshi. On the other level you might have to be doing some like some different stuff. Like it's that's that's the beauty of video games. You have a goal and, and the players, it's, it's up to you to figure out what skills and strategies you need to, to achieve that mission. So that's really hard for a coach because we've been trained, haven't we, to, to be really clear technically and tactically on what we're trying to coach. And that being really the primary, like the primary um, piece of information that would shape your, your session design, your practice design. Kind of flipping it and we're going, you know what, like. It's got to be one of these things. What are you working on? Because, you know, um, yeah, so it, what's the mission? So in football, in football coaching, where I've used this so far, um, I always refer to this example because I think it is the best example um, to give, which is the today's mission is to unlock your players from their zones. So we've all played, we've all designed games where players are maybe locked in zones to start with. It might be just like a 5v5 game that they're just locked in their zone to start with. That might just be the start point of that game. You know, the, 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 the mission is to have everyone unlocked by the end. And I haven't actually used any football language in that whatsoever. You know, no technical tactical jargon has came, has came out of that mission. So like once you have a mission, you then have to go, OK, well, the mission is that, then how do I how do I create some levels? You know, like, you know, take the princess example. So I know I've got a save princess, um, but but the first level that, that Mario faces is the easiest level. You know, it's like it's the one where problems are pretty easy to solve, probably get through the level like relatively quickly. And I think in, in, in a football term, so like maybe having players locked in zones to start with it probably does make the game easier because it's just like lots of 1v1s or 2v2s in each zone like the complexity is like scaled right down because time and space is less uh chaotic it's it's 
you know, there's less variance of time and space. It is what it is. It's one v one in this zone. But then as I start to unlock players, it starts to become a little bit more complex, a bit harder. Because now, like, well, my team's got f like five locked in, but their team has, has got four locked in. So, like, how does that, how does that make it more complex? Like decisions, there's different, like, decisions that have to be made that involve, like, more time and space considerations. So, it's thinking about the game in football in football ways it's like time and space time space and number of players probably dictate how tricky the game actually is on each level the other principle is is superpowers there's probably like a like a little bit of a misunderstanding sometimes with this um when coaches pick up this approach and, and aim to apply it is because i f i feel like sometimes the assumption is that superpowers are thrown in um, or given to players because they're struggling. You know, we all we've we all coach groups of players where people have different ability levels, and you have those players that that aren't able to sort of keep up with everyone else. So we'll give them the power, and it's it's definitely not that. So the purpose of a superpower is is to is for players to see the game in a different light for them to see the game and uh, from a perspective they would have never otherwise have seen it from. Because I'm a player, I'm a football player with a certain skill set. Me playing football right now, I've got a certain skill set. So which which means that I will see the game in a certain way. I, some stuff I just can't do. And there's some stuff that I can do. But as soon as I as soon as I get a power, I'm now seeing the game differently. Like that's me getting my sonic fast feet. You know, that's like wow I've it's not going to last me very long. It's like a 10 second superpower, but I'm, I now I've got this fast feet. It's opened up the game to me. It's like, I'm seeing it differently now. And I'm going to use this power the best of my ability. And that's what it is. It's, it's being effective for a short period of time, being more effective for a short period of time. And superpowers need to be earned because the key is for that player on that football pitch to realize, you know what? there's a really difficult problem that I'm facing and I think I might need a superpower to overcome it. And, and I've done it before in games where you just chuck a bib on the floor. You know, that's the superpower. It's there, it's on the floor, it's a bib. Okay, well, I'm locked in my zone. I can't get it. Okay, we need to work as a team to find a way of you getting that power. You know, and, but when I have got the power, I'm unlocked. I'm now unlocked from my zone with this superpower in my hand. I've now got an opportunity to help my team score a goal because I'm unlocked. Um, yeah, so it, it's, and a lot of people will say with superpowers, but they're unrealistic. That would never happen. You know, like this, one of my favorite superpowers is the invisibility cloak where you can run offside, but that would never happen in football. But it's not supposed to replicate what would happen. It's supposed to set up, um, an opportunity for players to practice their metacognitive game skills, to actually be aware and in control of that thought process, to recognise they need the power, to find a way of earning it, to utilise the power most effectively. And that's why, and that's why those powers exist. So using the pause button, um, this, I guess, like, mm -hmm. This was the, the actually it was the last principle that I ever thought of, um, but I'm so glad I'm so glad it fell into my head because it it just tied it all together. Um, and I remember the first time I tried this out with a group of players, uh, it was like a CPD event, and there was a lot of coaches on the sideline and players that I hadn't met before. And to emphasise this idea of players pausing the game, I went out to the pound shop and got them like all a little whistle to hold in their hand so I bought like 20 whistles and I was like they're gonna love this like they're gonna like it's just gonna remind them that they can like pause blow the whistle pause drop out the game and they were loving it when I handed out the whistles um and then of, of course the game started and like no one blew their whistle for the first <laughs> whatever throughout the whole practice <laughs> so I was a little bit gutted with that uh, but it did highlight to me you know how hard it is for players um, to access this type of uh, principle when they're playing, because when they're playing, they're, in, they're they're engrossed. They're not used to being in charge of their learning. They're they're not used to 
they're not used to it you know in school whether it be like yeah secondary school or whatever or, or organized sport it's nearly always the teacher or the coach that that stops learning intervenes ask questions set challenges gives a demonstration so yeah this this was um this is probably something that's that needs to be definitely scaffolded with players um and i found that you know actually i probably need to initiate the pause sometimes with the players but when they do come over and talk with me like when we do pause the practice they get to choose what type of support is on offer so we're gonna like when it's paused it might be oh we need a cheat oh we need a cheat we need a challenge we need a clue or we need to change the game it's the four c's framework that i try to use for the players and then they, and they can access what type of thing they want in that or need in that moment and then the last principle is saving progress so as we know like in video games it's really cool that you don't have to start from scratch every time you you stop playing and start again and um i i think that principle is is really important for how players learn in football as well so if i've reached level five like i really hope that we can come back to that game and, and carry on playing until i've achieved that mission you know for players it keeps them in that challenge that appropriate challenge point and it keeps them um as, as G says, it's that pleasant frustration. It's on the outer edge of capability. Um, and actually, it's, it's, G also says it's about like risk, like more likely to take risks. If I know that what I've achieved is banked and it's there and it's not going to go away. So here's a session plan. I, I tried to, I tried to integrate all the principles into into a visual to show how it could look. So as you can see, the mission is, it is simply to stay in the final of the World Cup. You know, there's no, there's no technical and tactical emphasis on any particular skills or, or anything like that. So like if there was a 14 tournament, for example, this is just a picture of one of the pitches. It might be that the levels, is, is this again a really simple concept is like the levels when you score on level one, it's worth five goals compared to if you score a goal on level five, it's just worth one. So that's how the levels get harder. Um, you've then got a superpower in there as well, which is the invisibility cloak, which I spoke, spoke about before. So you can only access that power if your team have the ball. So that's how it's so temporary. It might, it might only last literally a matter of seconds. Um, and then you have your four C's framework at the bottom where where players might just have access. It might just be they have got one each of those. So so team the O team might just have one cheat, one change, one clue, one challenge in, in this session. So they have to be quite clever around when to cheat, when to change, etc. Um, the challenge is is an interesting one because when I first started doing this, like, yeah, challenge like a technical and tactical challenge but I was like no like it, sh it shouldn't be a technical and tactical challenge because it's not about the technical and tactical that, that, that's going to happen as a result of playing but it's not the focus so I thought okay what about manipulation of time and space to make the task harder um, so in this instance it's you know the challenge is you're only going to play in three of three quarters of this space when you've got the ball you know, which makes it harder to attack and easier for the other team to defend. With the challenges aimed, do you usually have a set that you come up with or do you let the players come up with sometimes? I think it depends on your players, like, mm -hmm. depends on like the, yeah, what group you've got in front of you. Because if you're working with really young children, I think sometimes their challenges aren't necessarily meaningful um sometimes they're not actually a challenge <laughs> or it's kind of random um which is okay if that's what you're going after if it's if if you know if one of the other aims of you of your session was was to um to give them more ownership then fine um but in terms of the purist as as rusty would describe me as or mm -hmm. like the 
the actual purpose of the metacognition side, you might want to be want to have that um, prepared. So I would tend to have a whiteboard and just this this grid, the cheat, the change, the the challenge. I just have that on my whiteboard, mm -hmm. so players can clearly see. Okay, like if we choose challenge, that's what it is. If we ask for a clue, well, I actually don't put the clue on there because otherwise it's, it, it doesn't make sense. But I would, uh, if, if they ask for a clue, then then I will tell them. If they ask for a change, okay, that's what it is. And again, if I ask for a cheat, okay, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John John said, so do you play a timed game and then score at the end of the game will mean level up or stay? Exactly that. Yeah, exactly that. So you might might have your two pitches running, four teams. Okay, we're going to play for however many minutes. Uh, and then we'll come in. Okay, which team won? You're leveled up, you're staying. Yeah. Uh, when you bring them in as well, that might be an opportunity. I talked about scaffolding the pauses because... Mm -hmm like a new thing that you've not done with the kids before they might not have remembered to pause so at that point when you bring them in to level up you might just go here you go O team you've got an opportunity to, to, to access to pause and access one of these four C's you know that the one that says cheat that in this instance the VA, like VAR the op opponent's goal yeah that's definitely one that they remember to do by the way <laughs> like yeah. that's one that they'll, they tend to remember in action um, themselves yeah because it benefits right <laughs> I can win it, by cheating yeah. Yeah. exactly exactly yeah. and then so John Adamson has said uh, he says it's hard to write this question um, but we'll go with it anyway a player getting beat one-on-one -on -one may initially give up and accept that there's all they'll always get beat so need the coaches help to be more aware of why they're getting beat and look and then look to solve it yeah, that definitely. Could go down as a clue, right? <laughs> That's it, and I think with this, it's definitely not game is the teacher. Uh, it's not that at all. What it is, it's it's you're the coach, you're still the coach, and you're ready to coach when called upon. Because the the player in that situation, depending on his or her personality or ability level, they they might want to cheat really early doors. <laughs> you might just go, oh my god, I've just got beat. I only got beat once, but I want to cheat straight away. I want to know from the coach. I want you to tell me what I should do, what solution yeah. I should do next time. And that in itself could be a cheat, couldn't it? But it's for a coach, it's like you're not just gonna intervene as we would usually when we think we should or when we want to. It's we we're, we're watching, we're ready, we're observing what's happening, and when they want us, we're ready. When the players need us, we're here. Yeah, it, you know, so just maybe letting a trend. Uh, if it happens once, it's a one-off. If it happens twice, it could be the emergence of a trend, right? If it happens three times, it's a trend. Okay, now you need a, a clue or a, or, a, or a cheat, you know, if you're not solving it or picking it up yourself. Um, Scott's player, asking, he says, sorry, carry on, Aim. I was if the player keeps wanting to cheat. Um, I think that, again, that's your professional judgment as the coach to... Um, to manage with manage the situation with the player with the player. Um, yeah. And that's why I tend to put like you've only got one cheat, one change, one clue, one challenge. I try I try to have that where I can. Yeah, and that would be per team, right? Not per player. It could be I it could be per team, per player, completely up to up to you and, and the design of the game and how you want that to look. And also how well you feel you can manage it, because it could become messy. Have you um have you, have you, I'm sure you've considered this, but like, so for example, if if I don't want to use the cheat, for example, could I double up and say I want two clues? Is that is that um, is that an avenue you could go down? If you don't want to use a cheat, you yeah, so, so, yeah. So so yeah, could. if, I, if yeah. you could trade it yeah. in, kind of thing. I um, I've just then, uh, yeah. I just I just realised as you was talking the picture. Um, with the O's and the and the, and the boxes, mm -hmm. the diamonds, that's actually set up in a rugby style <laughs> shape um, because I was designing a rugby game beforehand. I, I did so. see the rugby ball, and I'm, <laughs> I thought your graphics were really crap. To be fair, I'm like I don't want to play that video game, but <laughs> it, it would make sense now. <laughs> um, yeah, another... I like that, Chris. Pardon? 
that's a good idea i like that where you can maybe have like less cheats more changes or like you know more cheats less clues or whatever you want yeah so like you get you get the four c's but now you can choose for so while so we're getting a fifth c there choice um you know whether you want to trade it in and da 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 da, da. you know just just i just yeah. as i was thinking that and i'm looking at that um player tokens for the four c's uh john john robbins said um yeah and then the, Scott McCall asked a, a while ago, and I thought I'd get to the question. He says, as creativity is so important in soccer, how would you work creativity into this structure during a session? And I think I think that's kind of been answered, hasn't it? Yeah, so like, I guess my view of creativity is, is players being able to come up with lots of different solutions to a problem. So, you know, if if, if we're talking about players being recognizing there's a problem and being uh, thoughtful about their process of how they're going to solve that you know what like it's not directly impacting creativity it's not the direct purpose but you would like to think due to the the many problems that will occur as a result of the game design and the different stuff that the game design affords such as superpowers such as pauses to overcome problems that it might help with creativity yeah and would certainly get some thinking right just yeah. thinking differently and you know getting people to scan and notice you know seeing what they're noticing and then thinking about like you said earlier how can i take advantage of that player am i quicker is it am i bigger you know what are their tendencies what what can i do so you just get some thinking in ways um you know yeah, for sure, for sure. So, any other? Is there any other burning questions from from anyone in the audience or yourself? Well, so no. So, like um, the question, one question I would have is, is you know, when you started implementing it, you gave us the story about the the you know the whistles. Um, at what ages did you start to implement it, and uh, who were the most receptive players? And then where did you get resistance and then people like, oh man, I can't get enough of this. What what were the, what was the key ages that you found or has it been, you know, uh, yeah, different I'd, all across? I'd, I've tried to be really like deliberate in testing it with like so many different age ranges and ability levels just because I think there's a myth, isn't there, around video games are for kids. And in the early days of explaining this with coaches, I feel sometimes some coaches might assume, oh, that only works with the young ones because uh, it's fun and it's engaging. It's like, no, I'm trying to explain that it's, it's, it's fun and it's engaging, but the primary purpose, as I explained, is the metacognitive game skills so, and strategic understanding. So I've tried with um, like six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds uh, and we've, we've managed to, in this particular game actually it's this exact game we played for about two months <laughs> because there was uh, i think 10 levels there's only five on here but there was like 10 levels plus a boss level and the kids just just wanted to come back and play it again because we did something similar to what you mentioned before chris around like for each game for each session sorry there was an opportunity to earn more cheats, more changes, more clues and more challenges as well, which just like added to like to the game. Like it was the same game that they kept playing week in, week out for two months. But every time it looked slightly differently because there was like um, different features in the game, different stuff that they could earn and access, like different powers and different stuff like that. So the young ones couldn't get enough of it. At the end of the day, it's football, isn't it? It's just yeah. football. As you can see from that football, apart from the, the people looking in rugby-like positions, <laughs> it is a, a football game. So in that, like part of that testing process for me was to, was to test myself as a coach, but also to test the approach in working with an under 18s uh, boys academy. There was two of them, two sessions I delivered in two boys academies, which I'd never coached players in that environment before at that age group. So it was it was a test in itself for me, but also to see how they'd respond to this and that in itself was quite fascinating because because one of the boys academies were 
absolutely loving it and they were they were just getting right into it I mean for example the change in the four seas the change was the thing they couldn't get enough of so they were like you know changing the, the where the goal was and altering the where the lines were on the pitch and where the halfway line was where the where this was where that was and it was brilliant it was so clever um and they, they I think maybe because the environment that they were used to prior to me just turning up rocking up and doing a session like their general environment was was one where they they tend to have a lot of ownership and a, like opportunity to, to solve problems and do stuff like this where the other one was like quite like quite the opposite it was quite um I think they kind of thought what what are we why are we doing this <laughs> I think they were like what are we working on like what are we practicing what's the techniques and the skills and the tactics that we're actually practicing here I think they're a bit kind of like we'll play and we'll get on with it but at the same time I don't think they realized what it was actually working on and how it could benefit benefit their game um so that like if if, if I was to go back with that group again I'd probably have to have to tell them the why why we're doing this and and what what the metacognitive game skills are and that's and that's I think that probably would have supported their buy-in yeah giving them the why early right um yeah. love that and you said that was a one that embraced it and then there's the one that didn't so much and and again down to environments right and and knowing but it's hard I suppose when you're going in and you're going into an academy you're going in and not knowing some of them too right yeah yeah, yeah. you know I didn't I didn't know any of the players yeah but, um sorry Chris no I, I, you were going to say something I was just going to say when I went into those two environments I did the same session in each one by the way in those under 18 teams and it wasn't this one it was it was one in my opinion that looked more 11 a sidey that's a word I just made up there, Levin Asadi. Um, yeah. Where you have like, it was positions as well. Position like you had a CDM, uh, a CAM, fullbacks, etc. It was more um, specific to Levin Asadi in terms of positions, roles, responsibilities, um, pitch markings, and stuff like that. The rules like offside, um, throw-ons, corners. So I did go into those two particular sessions like deliberately with a more um, 11 aside, realistic focus to the practice design, but it still had all of the principles in that missions, level up, superpowers, pauses. Yeah, and that brings us to a question from John. Um, John, thanks for the question. He said, can levels have specific actions that score points uh, level? Uh, example, three, three weaker foot passes before a goal, uh, or do you, can you give us some examples? So ultimately it's always going to be the decision of the coach, but if you want to work on metacognitive game skills and that with that in mind, if that is your objective, then I would be asking the question why you would want to attach technical actions or skills to levels. Because if the mission is to save the princess, then how I do that, it needs to be decided on by me depending on you know all that stuff we spoke about early on about game state about my strengths their weaknesses um and, and all that stuff that you know that will change how i actually end up saving the princess it's like like three passes before a goal might not actually help me achieve the mission yeah especially if you can score a goal right after that yeah before the three passes yeah yeah, yeah. brilliant well, so just, sorry, just to add to that to give a bit more, bit more meat on the bones. That is like, that's where we've got to be clever with designing our level ups. Um, so, so is it if it's the unlocking game? You know, like, is it just this? Is it just the case of scoring more goals than your opponent after ten minutes, and that's how you level up? Like, that surely is the easiest way of of deciding on level ups rather than necessarily trying to integrate five passes or you know one touch finish or whatever it might be yeah um i wonder if there's any more questions 
please type them in right now because we've been on um, for 75 minutes. Um, and Amy and I, actually, funnily enough, we were on half an hour before talking about that 15 minutes, 45 minutes is the way to go. And we've just uh, we've just exceeded that and smashed the time barriers. Uh, we needed to level up there, Amy. We've got extended time. Um, pardon, Amy? I needed to pause or you needed to tell me to pause. <laughs> no, listen, I, I think, um, you know, one of the questions I would have right now, and I want to be sensitive to your time, obviously, and I do have some other questions that I wanted to ask you, but we'll, we will, we will uh, save progress and we'll start with those next time. Um, sure. But so obviously with COVID and we've not really touched upon it, people are going, doing return to plays right now. And it's a lot of individual Individual training, my friend Steve Davis, who's on, he, you know, he says, I, I refuse to call it isolated training because we've been in isolation. It's individual training in a collective environment. What advice or how does video game design approach look, right, in these coming weeks? What tips could you give us is part one, and I'll just pause there for a second. And then to all the coaches that are on and all the coaches that will watch this later, how can you go away and implement video game design to these sessions that we're going back and doing now? And then if we could get back together in six to eight weeks and have Amy back on again and resume our uh, safe progress, you know, what does that look like? So first part is Amy, what advice can you give us to try and incorporate that now? Um, and then how, 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 how about six to eight weeks again in, in catching up and, and reframing it and talking about some of the experiences from the coaches and what they did? I'll answer the second one first because it's easier. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> it was a lot easier, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> definitely up for um, for reconvening if, if coaches would, would like to because I would find that fascinating myself. I'd love to hear the stories from the coaches. Um, in terms of the first question, so what would it look like on an individual coaching basis? So my, my personal view is, can you teach metacognition when there isn't an opponent? I think that's the, that would be my place to start in my mind. If you'd have asked me that like two years ago, I'd have said no. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking is is leaned more towards I, th I think I think we can I think we can because even when I'm practicing it practicing as an individual and it might be some sort of um, dribbling practice or or whatever I still have to be thinking about all of that stuff we spoke about before like the what the who in terms of myself my strengths my tendencies the way I'd learn um the how you know, how i actually put this skill into action i still have to be thinking about all of that i still have to be ready to tweak i still have to be ready to, to think about the when i might take a touch slightly differently and why i have taken it differently you know whether that's because of like because of the surface that i'm playing on whether it's because of like where the mannequin is standing or whether it's it's because of like the speed of my like the speed of my previous touch or like my previous touch wasn't great so I had to like take the next one differently like I still think there's opportunity to think metacognitively even without the opponent present which is like and I'm still working this out in my own head as well by the way in terms of in terms of all of that so so can I still plan ahead without an opponent yeah definitely can I still um set problems that's probably like a probably like one with a little bit of a question mark at the moment um might might be a case of setting problems for myself setting problems for myself to kind of uh overcome um can i and then a third metacognitive game skill can i can i find out some information that's going to help me definitely definitely finding out information about like the preview like can i can I make note of the previous touch like or can I can I find out information about like where where the next bit of like space is once I've got past the mannequin can I find find out some stuff about like the type of serve that that um the the coach might be playing to me 
Yeah. You know, there's still lots of information in the environment and from a technical basis that you could probably pick up on. You know, like something even as simple as like weather. You know, can I find out like what's like the wind and the rain if that's like affecting affecting my next move? I'm still yeah. sussing all that out, if I'm honest, but I still think, you know, can, can I pause when I'm working one to one? Definitely. Okay. Can there be levels? Definitely. Yeah, so I, you know, I did a little something yesterday with with younger players, and it was, uh, you know, I showed them a level, and it was keepy ups, and then it might it was like thigh thigh foot foot catch. When you get that, you you yell level up. Level two was thigh thigh foot 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 catch. When you yell it, you get level up. And I gave children like two pauses, and I said if you drop it, you have to start again, or you could hit a pause, and you get to use two pauses and you could carry on where you left off. And then I had them create their level three and show a friend, but using the physical distancing. So, you know, I'm, I was trying to think along those lines, but, you know, I get what you're saying with the metacognition and the environment and, and that kind of stuff. It, it's just, you know, I'm trying to implement it because me personally, I think the, obviously, we're, we're training collectively, but they're in individual squares. And, you know, that's one player, one ball. And it takes us back to probably we've all done it as coaches, the old Corva stuff, touches, touches, no decisions, right? And I want kids making decisions or thinking about, uh, the, you know, the things they want to do as well. So I'm just trying to think, how do we, you know, I most kids are happy to see their friends right now, just happy to be outside and close to each other. Um, but how do we get that excitement back you know, for the game, because we can't really play at this minute. Mm. You know what I, mean? I mean, you could you could set all of the ind individual players, couldn't you, a mission? Mm -hmm. around, I don't know if it's something to do with, um, like, I, I try to use words, finding, escaping, building, mm -hmm. unlocking, um, and then you could relate that back down to um, something within their space. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about, I'm not definitely sure about whether it's technical action or mm -hmm. something different. I, I'm not sure. I think you can definitely, I, I would say there's definitely still decision making within just a, like a me and my ball situation. Yeah. There's decision making, isn't there? There's still stuff that I need to decide on. Um, and it could become like, unopposed practice could become like much more exciting for kids if they have the opportunity to have a superpower for example you know yeah. i could I, my power might be that um if, if i'm in one box doing something you're in the other box doing something i might use a superpower against you i might throw a red shell at you you know i hit you with a red shell which means you can't use your right foot anymore yeah, slowing the progress of somebody else. I like that. Yeah. I love that. You got me thinking now. We could go on for hours, but I want to be sensitive to your time, Amy. Um, Amy, Amy, any last words of advice for people trying to embark on this journey of digital video games approach? Just, um, just, just keep exploring and and keep trying stuff out. As you could probably tell from this, like some stuff I'm I'm pretty decided on, and there's still so much that. That needs to be like explored you know trying stuff seeing what works give it a go yeah and, and i think it's huge right and uh amy's twitter handles at the bottom there if people want to follow her and get a hold of her but i just think it's important we have a as, as bastions and guardians of the game uh we we have a responsibility to keep players in amy and i were talking before we started recording just about in this country, it's seven out of 10 teenagers are dropping out of sports, you know? So how, as we, as coaches who are on this uh, and who will watch this later, how can we keep children involved, engaged, uh, give them a role in their own learning process and stuff like that, and uh, just help them grow and they are future coaches. It looks like we have another question that's come in. Uh, thank you for your time, Amy. Can't wait to dive into trying when we resume. So. Uh, good stuff, John. Thank you. I really but, appreciate it. Thank you. Well, listen, everybody, I can't, Amy, thank you 
thanks for for being on and sharing your time with us and uh i'll i'll get in touch with you and i'll i'll hook you up with vince who couldn't be with us and hopefully he can be with us again i know he's going to be uh thrilled um you did have a statement but i won't read it but i will send it to you amy so you have how you've changed vince's coaching and his thinking so thank you for for that and uh thanks for your role in 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 my journey now and i look forward to continuing and resuming where we we left off 100 percent. no thank you so much um just yeah hopefully if there's if there's any further questions or if you wanted to follow up like you said in the future i'd, I'd definitely be up for that yeah we will we'll do that and uh we, we'll challenge the coaches you know can you come up with some some activities some video game design to engage the players and and find ways especially in this in these different times and um you know our next one um is next thursday with tom hartley from uk coaching uh formerly of arsenal do you know tom amy yeah i do yeah he's a top guy yeah be... yeah so we're looking forward to having tom on and um we've been blessed like i said to you to have some so many great people and we can't thank you enough for sharing your time with us today and uh, i'll be in touch yeah cool thanks chris thanks everybody take care be well